Uh, welcome everyone to uh, today's uh, geometry and topology seminar at uh, Durham. So uh, it's a pleasure to welcome Luca Rizzi uh, from the Institut Fourier in, in Grenoble. And, uh, and he will talk about interpolation inequalities in Sobermannian geometry. So thank you, Luca. Okay, so thank you, Fernando, for, uh, for the invitation. So I'm going to talk about uh, interpolation inequalities in, uh, in the Sobermannian setting. I will give an overview of this uh, research topic, which has been my more or less main research focus in the last uh, few years. Uh, so it's going to be a very general audience uh, talk, so I'm not, I'm not going to uh, details, so, and please feel free to, to stop me if, uh, if needed. So let me start with the, the simplest uh, interpolation equality there is, uh, which, is uh, what I, which is the Euclidean and Minkowski inequality. Uh, so it is uh, the, the following inequality. Take two sets, uh, A and B in Rn, and uh, with these two sets, uh, you define the Minkowski sum, uh, A plus B, which is the, the vector sum of all points uh, uh, of, um, of points in A plus points in B. So if A is, is this uh, circle and B is this rectangle, you obtain this uh, big uh, set uh, in, in, the, in the picture. And uh, the Brominkowski inequality is uh, a lower bound on the measure of the uh, Minkowski sum. So uh, it, it reads as follows: the, the Minkowski, the, the measure. So here the measure is the Lebesgue measure in Rn of the, the set A plus B uh, to the power one over n, where a small n here is the dimension, uh, is uh, greater or equal than the sum of the measure of A and the measure of B to the power one over uh, one over n. So there is also uh, a version of the Minkowski of the Minkowski inequality, which is completely equivalent to the previous one, which is uh, given in terms of the Minkowski interpolation. So instead of uh, considering the Minkowski sum of A and B, I consider a uh, one-parameter family of sets, which is the Minkowski interpolation between A and B. So it is obtained uh, as follows: uh, you take a point in A, a point in B, and you take the segment between A and B, parameterized on the interval 0, 1. And you take the point at time t of this segment. Okay, So you obtain, in, in this way, a one-parameter family of, uh, of sets, uh, which for t equal to 0 is equal to uh, A, for t equal to 1 is equal to B, and in the middle it uh, interpolates in a kind of linear way. And the Brumikowski inequality, in this, uh, in this sense, uh, he, it's uh, the statement that the measure of the Minkowski interpolation to the power one over n is uh, concave, okay? So the measure, the Lebesgue measure of the Minkowski interpolation to the power one over n is greater or equal than the linear interpolation between the measure of a to the power one over n and the measure of b to the power one over n, okay? So this is a very important uh, inequality mathematics. Uh, it comes out in a lot of uh, settings. For example, it can be used to prove the isoperimetric inequality, but there are also many other applications. So now uh, we want to add some geometry to the picture. Okay. So what can we say about the uh, Brumikowski inequality in uh, on a Riemannian manifold? So take a complete Riemannian manifold and now take. Uh, uh, two non-empty sets, as before, we would like to uh, generalize the concept of uh, Minkowski interpolation, right? So now we don't have a concept of, um, we don't have the sum of two points uh, because we are, no, we are no longer on Rn, but we can uh, define an interpolation just by replacing segments uh, with geodesics, right? So uh, for two given sets A and B, we define the uh, interpolation at time t, which is this set, Zt, of A and B, obtained uh, as follows. Take a point in A, a point in B, take um, the geodesic or the geodesics, there may be more than one between the, the first point and the end point. The ge geodesics will be always parameterized on the interval uh, 0, 1 uh, for obvious reasons. And then you take the point at time t of this geodesic. Uh, and you obtain this uh, blue set, which is a one parameter family of sets that interpolates between A and, uh, and B. And this setting indeed to, to have some Brumin-Kosky type inequality, you need uh, some assumption on the, on the curvature of the space. And we have this uh, very nice result uh, due to uh, Cordero-Rascan mechanism. 
So this is a consequence of um, their uh, mean results, which says that uh, if the rich curvature of my manifold is non-negative, uh, non then uh, the following inequality holds. So we have a um, room cost inequality uh, exactly uh, equal to the one we have in the first space. So here vol is just the, the Riemannian volume of, uh, of the Riemannian manifold, but everything else is the same. So the volume of the interpolating set to the power one over n, where this n is the dimension of the manifold, is uh, greater or equal than the linear interpolation between the volume of a to the power one over n and the volume of b to the power one over n. And indeed, this is the case when the rich curvature is non-negative, uh, but if the rich curvature is bounded from below by some constant, say k, positive or negative, then you have a similar inequality, but with modified uh, coefficients. Okay, so I've chosen this one because it's uh, the case k equal to zero, because as usual, it's the, the simplest one. So as I said uh, before, uh, this, uh, this result is actually a consequence of uh, more general uh, interpolation inequalities that can be uh, expressed in, term of, in terms of optimal transport. And uh, this is what I'm going to talk next. So I want to introduce these inequalities from the point of view of optimal transport. And to do that, to do that uh, let me introduce some terminology. So what is the, the problem of uh, optimal transportation? So it's uh, now here in the Brumikowski inequality, we are moving sets, okay? Set A that moves from A to B. And now we, the natural uh, generalization of these uh, is uh, moving of uh, measures, okay? So take two measures, mu zero and mu one, two probability measures. So P of M is the space of probability measures on, uh, on M. And uh, we are interested in uh, transport maps. So maps T on, uh, on the manifold that, that send the first measure, mu zero, to uh, the measure mu one. Okay, so you're sending this distribution of mass here to uh, mu zero to the distribution of mass mu one through the map T. And we would like to do it in the most efficient way. Okay, so we would like to uh, minimize some, some cost. So we want to bring mu zero to mu one, minimizing some cost. And the cost that we choose is the following one. So the, the cost to move uh, mu zero to mu one through the uh, map T is the integral of the square distance between uh, the start point and the end point. And so we are interested to minimize this, this object here. So the usual problems are the existence of a map that uh, minimizes this, uh, this cost, the, unique, the uniqueness and uh, the regularity of, uh, of the minimum when it exists. And uh, in, in the remaining case, it turns out that uh, the picture is, uh, is very clear. So we have the following result due to uh, works of uh, Brenier in the Euclidean setting and uh, later extended by McCann in the remaining case. So we have the, the following theorem of uh, well-posedness, let's say, of the, optimal of, of the optimal transportation problem. So take two, two measures, mu zero and mu one, uh, which should be uh, compactly supported for simplicity and uh, also absolutely continuous for simplicity. So absolutely continuous uh, with respect to the uh, Riemannian measure. Then we, we have the following results. First, there exists a unique optimal transport map between mu zero and mu one. So existence of the uh, solution of the previous problem. So when I say unique, it means unique up to uh, a set uh, or up to a redefinition on a set of measure zero, clearly. And uh, then for all, the second point is that for almost every point um, in X, uh, there exists a unique geodesic uh, connecting X with the end point T of X. So this means that uh, the, the transport uh, works exactly as you can imagine. So the, the mass points move along geodesics. And this second point essentially is it's telling you that for almost any, almost any point is moved outside of the catalogs. And then since using this uh, family of geodesics, so for, any, for almost every, any, any X, you have a geodesic gamma T, you can push forward the initial measure mu zero to obtain a one parameter family of measures mu T, which goes from mu zero to mu one. 
and this in a sense the, the, the best way the best way to interpolate between mu zero and mu one. So it is called what is called a, a Wasserstein geodesic between mu zero and mu one. Uh, geodesic because you can put a metric structure on the space of probability measures, uh, and this mu t is precisely a geodesic in this uh, in this space. And for me, an interpolation inequality is an inequality for functionals on the space of probability measures along the vaster geodesics. Okay, so this is uh, most general, the most general interpolation inequality I have in mind. And here you have an example due to McCann. Uh, so I'm going to define a, a functional u. This function is, uh, is called entropy, Renyi entropy. Uh, we are on Rn, so this small n is the, the n that you have here, is the dimension of the manifold in this case. And uh, if mu is absolutely continuous, uh, the, the entropy is just the integral uh, of the density of this measure uh, to the power one minus one divided by n. This is just a convention if you want. And it turns out that in the Euclidean space, uh, this entropy functional is convex uh, along uh, Wasserstein geodesics. Okay, so u of mu t is uh, smaller or equal than uh, y one minus t u of mu zero plus t u of mu one. And indeed, this holds true uh, also on uh, Riemannian structures with Ricci curvature bounded below. Okay, the same inequality. And you can see this as a generalization of the Brumming Kosky inequality uh, in the Riemannian setting. And in fact, you can prove the Brumming Kosky inequality for sets by using this inequality here for measures. Uh, you just have to take mu zero and mu one. You, you just have to, to choose a suitable uh, mu zero and, uh, and mu one associated to the sets A and B. An important thing about uh, these uh, interpolation inequalities is that, uh, and this interpolation inequality in particular for, uh, for the entropy, is that it can, it can be used to define rich curvature bounds uh, for, uh, for general spaces, for metric measure, for metric measure spaces. Uh, indeed, the, the optimal transportation problem is something that you can define in a, a metric measure space. And uh, so it makes sense uh, to ask for the convexity of, of some functional and use this convexity to define the concept of Ricci curvature bound. And this definition is well posed because in the Riemannian setting, uh, uh, these entropic uh, inequalities are equivalent to, have, to having um, Ricci uh, bounded from below. And this was the, the beginning of the uh, theory of a synthetic uh, Ricci curvature bounds, uh, uh, which started with the uh, Sturm and uh, Lot Villani, but then there are several other, other authors uh, which studied this uh, kind of uh, properties in, uh, in, the recent, uh, in the recent years. Okay, so I'm not going to talk about this theory in particular, but I just wanted to explain what an interpolation inequality is and why uh, they are important. So what we want to do is to uh, discuss the problem, the existence of interpolation inequalities uh, in the sub Riemannian setting. Uh, so the sub Riemannian setting is a, a generalization. So sub Riemannian geometry is a generalization of Riemannian geometry, uh, where uh, essentially you can move only along some preferred uh, directions. So I'm gonna give you the, the definition here, it's very simple. So take a smooth manifold, and now the, the new ingredient is the, this D, this um, sub-bundle of, uh, of, of the tangent bundle. So usually in the classical definition, you have uh, a, a true sub-bundle, so something with constant uh, rank, but uh, it's quite easy to uh, build a theory uh, where the distribution is um, rank varying in the sense that the rank of the distribution can change from point to point. Uh, if you prefer, just stick with the case of uh, standard uh, distribution. What is important is that we need to assume the, the, the so-called Hormander condition. So uh, here, if D is a, a proper sub-bundle, uh, that is uh, for any point, uh, the set, uh, the, the fiber of D is uh, strictly smaller than the full tangent space at the point X, uh, then um, this, this is the only case in which this condition here is non-trivial, non otherwise it is trivial. But anyway, let me explain it. Uh, what is the Hormander condition that we will always assume is the, uh, the requirement that even if your distribution does not cover all possible directions by taking a Lie bracket of sufficient length, 
you can obtain, uh, you can recover all directions uh, on the tangent space. We will see some examples later on. And, uh, and then you put on this uh, distribution uh, a smooth scalar product, okay? So indeed, if D is the, the full tangent space, uh, then this is definition of a subremanian, of a, a, a Riemannian structure. Otherwise, you have a restriction on uh, the possible uh, vectors for which you can measure the length. And then in this setting, you can define a concept of admissible or horizontal curve, which are curves uh, that are tangent to the distribution at each, uh, at each point. And for these trajectories, it makes sense to measure the length as, uh, as in the Riemannian case. And then you can define uh, a distance by minimizing this length, uh, keeping the endpoint fixed. And indeed, a priori, if this Hormander condition is not verified, uh, for example, when you have a foliation, uh, then you may have point, usually you have points uh, which are not connected by any admissible trajectory. So this object here is not a true distance. But if the Hormander condition is satisfied, and this is precisely the reason for which we assume this uh, condition, uh, then uh, there is a theorem that tells you uh, that for any pair of points, uh, there exists uh, an admissible trajectory joining them. So in particular, this distance is uh, finite. And uh, moreover, we also have that uh, the, the manifold M equipped with this distance uh, has the same topology of M as a smooth manifold. So um, it's a good distance compatible with uh, the structure that you already have. Okay, so uh, let me show you an example. Uh, so this is related with the parking of a car. So as you know, when you park your car, you cannot uh, park your car directly in the, parking, in, the, in the parking spot because you cannot move sideways like that. But um, anyway, uh, using a combination of admissible movements, so by steering uh, the, the wheels and moving back and forth, you can move your park into the parking spot. So how do we model uh, this, uh, this kind of process here? By a, a subremanian structure. So in the following way. First, let me simplify the model. My, my car will have only two wheels. And uh, the configuration space of my simplified car uh, is uh, given by a point in R2, that is the, the position of my car, and uh, a point in S1, that is the orientation of uh, my steering wheel. Or of my car. And uh, the accessible directions are uh, the following. So first we can move forward. So in this configuration space, uh, x, big X is uh, an admissible direction, so given by this explicit vector field. And the other uh, admissible movement is the change of direction, right? We can steer the, the car. So these X and Y are my admissible directions. And then I can define a distribution by taking uh, the distribution generated by uh, the vector fields X and Y. And you can check that if you take, if you compute the Lie bracket between X and Y, you obtain a vector field Z, Z which is not in the, in the picture, but uh, which is here. And it is precisely the uh, vector which is perpendicular to X, okay? So the, the Hormander condition is verified by this distribution. And indeed, you can uh, go from any point to any other point of the configuration space uh, by a trajectory that is always tangent to X and Y, to the, the distribution generated by X and Y. And then it makes sense to put a metric on this distribution, for example, the metric that makes X and Y orthonormal. And then it makes sense to find the, uh, the trajectories that minimize the, the length uh, that is the, the most efficient way to park, to move your car from X to, to Y with a given uh, orientation at the initial point at the end um, and the, at the end point. Okay, so this was a uh, uh, first example. So the second example, which is related with the previous one in the sense that uh, it is the, it arises as the um, chrome of tangent space of the previous structure, isometric space. So this is the so-called Heisenberg group. So it is a subremanian is a, is a, a sub structure in R3, defined by uh, the global orthonormal frame uh, given by these two expressions, x1 and x2. 
So when I say that a subdomain structure is defined by uh, a global a global uh, orthonormal frame, I I mean that the distribution is the distribution generated by x1 and x2, and the metric is the metric that makes x1 and x2 orthonormal. So here you have a picture of this uh, distribution, which is the standard contact distribution of three. And uh, it is called a group because uh, you have a group structure that makes uh, these two vector fields left invariant. It is an important uh, group structure. And then you can keep uh, this. Uh, uh, so this is the metric that you obtain in this way is left invariant by this group structure. And moreover, you also have uh, that the uh, Lebesgue measure in these coordinates, that is the x, the y, the z, is uh, left invariant too. So it makes sense to uh, equip this uh, structure with the uh, Lebesgue measure. So here in this uh, very simple example, you already see uh, two features of uh, subdomain geometries. That is first, the Hausdorff dimension, this the, the metric dimension, is bigger than the topological dimension. So for example, here in the Heisenberg group, uh, the Hausdorff dimension is equal to four. This is due to the fact that uh, direction X and Y are um, directly accessible, but direction Z is not. So it counts in, as two from the point of view of dimension, of the out of dimension. And then the second uh, interesting uh, feature is that, uh, so look at this, uh, this is the picture of a sphere in the Heisenberg group. So forget this uh, inner part here, just look at the sphere which stops here, this, uh, this singularity here, you have a corner. And uh, this corner repeats uh, at all scales. So uh, even if you consider very, very small uh, spheres, you still have this singularity. So small spheres are not smooth. And this never happens in the Riemannian case, right? Because these are met yeah? These are metric spheres, right? Is metric spheres, yes. Metric spheres. Yes, yes, yes. Metric spheres, yes. And if you want the, the inner part, this strange part inside is the set of endpoints of uh, geodesics uh, with length one, okay? This is not very intuitive for a, a Riemannian geometer because uh, you should, uh, you, when you are a Riemannian geometry, uh, the set of endpoints of very short geodesic with length one, or length uh, epsilon say, the geodesics will be optimal. So the endpoints will stay on the sphere. Here, this is not the case because you can lose optimality. Uh, even for very, very small length of your geodesic. So this is another way to say this is that the cat locus from a point X always touches X itself, okay? So this is some very, very strange phenomenon that we have in the subdomain case. Okay, so let me uh, describe uh, another very important feature of uh, subdomain geometry. And uh, I will describe it uh, staying in the, in the context of this uh, example of the Heisenberg group. So now here we have a metric defined on a subbundle of rank two. Let me add, let me complete this, uh, this metric to a true Riemannian metric, right? So uh, let me define this metric G epsilon, which, is, uh, which coincides with the Heisenberg one on the distribution. And then we add uh, this piece here, okay? that gives uh, length, allows me to measure length of vectors that are, uh, that go in uh, the Z direction. And I put a factor one over epsilon here. So this is um, a true Riemannian metric, mm, G epsilon. And uh, when epsilon goes to zero, when epsilon is very small, then it's uh, very expensive from the length point of view to move along the Z direction directly, right? So when epsilon goes to zero, uh, you can imagine that the, the best way the, to, to move from a point to another one is not, is just to move along the distribution, the Heisenberg distribution, where the, the metric is finite. And this is exactly what happens. Indeed, you have that R3 equipped with the distance associated with this uh, G epsilon converge uh, in the ground of sense, but also on, on a more classical sense for example, on, uh, on compare sets, converge to a sub Riemannian distance of the Heisenberg group. So you can approximate uh, your uh, sub Riemannian structure using Riemannian ones, and you can do this um, in a very general setting. You can always find, at least locally, uh, a way to approximate a sub Riemannian structure using Riemannian structure. 
But the problem is that in this approximation, uh, the sequence of curvatures is unbounded from below and also from above. Uh, so, for example, in this specific example, the sectional curvature explodes to minus infinity for any uh, pair of, uh, uh, for any section obtained using uh, uh, vectors in the distribution. And so also the Ricci curvature explodes to minus infinity for any uh, vector in the distribution. But if you take sections uh, which contain also the Z uh, component, uh, then the curvature can explode also to plus infinity. So the curvature is really unbounded from any, uh, from any side. And so you cannot hope to prove theorems on subliminal, mani on subliminal manifolds by uh, proving first some theorem on the Riemannian manifold and then uh, passing to the limit, at least uh, because usually, uh, at least not for theorems uh, that uh, are stable uh, for a structure with uh, that satisfy a global rich curvature bound. Okay. For example, the Brumin-Kosk inequality uh, is an equality which is stable in a suitable sense for sequence of manifolds uh, with rich curvature bound from below. But uh, you cannot build uh, an approximation of subriemannian structures using Riemannian structure with curvature bound from below, with rich curvature bound from below. Okay. So you cannot adopt this naive approach to, to say something about the uh, about subliminal structure. So here I have in mind uh, um, I have in mind uh, Brumin cost inequality, but this is true for many results. Okay, you cannot just take the limit in using the Riemannian approximation. Not at least not in a naive way. Okay, so what we know about the Brumin cost inequality in the Heisenberg group. So the first result uh, about this in, in this in this direction uh, is an old one by Nicolas Julier, who proved that um, the brumin cosk inequality does not hold in the, in the Eisenberg group. So recall that the brumin cosk inequality is this inequality here for some big N, which maybe is the topological dimension, but maybe can be another number. So he proved that this inequality is violated for any possible value of n. So in particular, I built uh, sets uh, with measure one, such that the measure of the uh, interpolation at time one half is more than one. And you can see easily that this uh, implies that this inequality cannot be true for any value of big N. So the brumin cosk inequality does not hold. So I will call from now on this inequality here, BM from brumin cosky zero N. So the n is the n that we have here, and the zero is because this is the version with curvature zero of the brumin cosk inequality. Okay, so we also have the BM KN, which is the version corresponding to uh, a general Ricci lower bound, but um, I'm not going to talk about it. Okay, so um, brumin cosk inequality does not hold for any exponent n. But uh, you also proved another interesting uh, fact. So I proved that uh, what holds is a weaker inequality uh, that uh, is a version of, is uh, what you obtain from the brumin cost inequality when one of the two sets is a point. So for example, here, if A is a point, uh, then this guy on the, on the right, uh, the, the first factor uh, is, uh, is zero. You only have the second factor. So you can raise to the power N and you obtain this, uh, this inequality here. So this is the so-called measure contraction property. So it, uh, what are you doing here? You have a point uh, X, you have some set uh, A, and you are contracting uh, following geodesics, the set A to X. So this is the set, uh, if you want, uh, this is the set uh, ZT of uh, X A, okay? So the measure contraction property is um, a polynomial control on the measure of the interpolating set, uh, which has this form, okay? Polynomial in the sense that you have a factor t to the power n. And Julier proved that uh, this inequality holds uh, for all n bigger or equal than five. And five is the best number that you can put here in the sense that if you put uh, five minus epsilon, then you can find a set for which this inequality does not hold, okay? And this was strange at first because, uh, well, in the Heisenberg group, you have seen that the topological dimension is three, the halves of dimension, so the metric dimension is four, 
And then you see this uh, five, which is the optimal number you can put here. So one expected the halves of dimension, for example, right? But this is not what we, what we have. And uh, now um, this number is better understood. Uh, so it is what is called the geodesic dimension, which is related with the, uh, the asymptotic of the exponential map for small times in the subliminal setting. And it turns out that uh, in the subliminal case, you always have these three dimensions, the topological dimension, the halves of dimension, and the geodesic dimension, which are uh, always different in the in subliminal case. For example, in the Heisenberg group, they are three, four, and five. And the fact that they are different uh, is the origin of uh, many uh, interesting facts uh, in the in subliminal geometry. Okay, so this is a very quick uh, recap of uh, the Julia result. In the next uh, chapter in the in the story is the result of uh, um, Balo Cristalli and Sipos. Okay, more recently, they proved that even if the Bruminkowski, the classical Bruminkowski inequality does not hold, uh, a modified version of the Bruminkowski inequality holds in the in the Heisenberg group. So, which has the following, uh, which has the following form. So, as you can see, it's uh, like the classical Bruminkowski inequality. You have the measure of the interpolating set to the power. Um, Oh, there is a question in the chat. How the Jurassic dimension is defined? So I didn't give the definition. Uh, I will give you later a possible definition, okay? So if, uh, if the definition I will give later uh, does not answer your, your question, please stop me again. Okay. Mm. Okay, this, uh, this inequality here, uh, which was proved by Balo, Christine, and Sipos, uh, is very similar to the Bruminkowski one. Uh, so you have the measure of the interpolating set to the power one over three. Three is the, the good number, the topological dimension, the same you have in the, in the usual Bruminkowski inequality in the Euclidean case, for example. But now on the right hand side, you don't have a linear interpolation of the measures, but you have uh, weights here at the exponents. Okay, these exponents, five over, over three, five over three. So in the, this inequality is weaker than the Bruminkowski inequality, in zero, three, because, uh, well, these numbers here, one minus T and T are smaller than one. And here at the exponent, you see the ratio between these two dimensions, the topological one and uh, the, geodesic, uh, the geodesic dimension I mentioned before. Okay, so, for the Eisenberg group, uh, Juliet told us that the standard Bruminkowski is not the right one, but Balo, Cristalli, and Sipos told us that uh, a modified version of the Bruminkowski inequality holds, which is this one. So the question was uh, whether general subliminal structure, so not only the Heisenberg group, support some kind of interpolation inequality with weights that may depend on the underlying geometry. So this was the main question uh, at that point. And as you can imagine, the answer is yes. And the next few slides, I'm going to present this, uh, this result. So I need to introduce an assumption first. Mm, I'm going to work only with the so-called ideal subriemannian structure. Uh, so what is the, an ideal subriemannian structure? Uh, well, first, let me mention that mm, in subriemannian geometry, there are two types of geodesics. So geodesics are length minimizing uh, curves, okay? Uh, parameterized with, co with constant speed. So geodesics in subliminal geometry uh, can be of two types. There are normal geodesics, which are the good ones, uh, the ones that follow a nice Hamiltonian dynamics, uh, exactly as you have in the Riemannian case. And then you have abnormal geodesics. So the abnormal geodesics are related with the fact that your distribution uh, is not the full tangent space at each point. Indeed, in the Riemannian case, you do not have abnormal geodesics, and indeed, you don't, don't need to introduce this uh, distinction. You only have geodesics. They are all normal. But in the subliminal case, you have abnormal geodesics. So they are related with the singularity of the distribution, essentially. And uh, I say that uh, a subliminal structure is ideal. Uh, well, if it is complete as a metric space, uh, that's, that's fine. And uh, moreover, uh, it has no non-trivial abnormal minimizing geodesics. So non-trivial because the, uh, the trivial geodesic, uh, that is the geodesic that just does not move, this is always 
trivial. Uh, sorry, this is always abnormal in the, in the summary manner set. So this is why I need to say non-trivial here. But that is the only geodesic, mm, that is the only abnormal geodesic we can have. And this is the generic picture in the sense that uh, as, as soon as the, the rank of the distribution is bigger or equal than three, then for an open and then set in the within topology of uh, in the space of distribution and matrix, uh, the, the structure is ideal. Okay, the structure is ideal. We do not have non trivial abnormal geodesics. So as soon as the, uh, the rank is bigger than three, this uh, assumption is generically satisfied. But then there are uh, special classes of uh, structure where this, uh, um, this, uh, this assumption is always satisfied. So not generically, but for any structure of that, that type. For example, if the distribution is a contact distribution, that is the, given by the kernel of some non-degenerate one form, then uh, the ideal assumption is always satisfied. And more generally for a distribution that satisfy the strong form under condition, uh, I'm not giving you the detail, but uh, it's a strong version of the Romander condition in the sense uh, you only need uh, the Lie bracket with one vector field. I mean, the Lie bracket uh, uh, with one vector field is enough to generate the whole tangent space. And in this case, the uh, ideal assumption is satisfied for any, um, for any distribution of this type. Okay, so. Now we are in the ideal setting. Let me introduce the distortion coefficient that will appear in our interpolation inequalities. So um, take a um, subramana manifold, fix a smooth measure. So M here is um, a general smooth measure. It is a measure given in uh, coordinates by, um, sorry, given by a um, smooth density. And I need to uh, choose a, a general measure because in the subramana setting, as you can imagine, there is no canonical measure. Okay, the metric is defined only on a subbundle of the tangent bundle, so there is no way to to define a canonical uh, measure in general, right? So just pick any smooth measure and work with it. And uh, I'm going to define a distortion coefficient. So pick a, pick a point x and a point y on your manifold, x and y here as in the picture. Take a ball at y of radius r. And then take the, the contraction of this ball to X. So if you want, it is the interpolation between uh, this ball and X uh, using the map ZT that we defined before. And you obtain this uh, blue, blue guy here. Uh, and then you compute the, the ratio of the measure of the blue guy uh, with the measure of the red guy, measure with respect to the uh, measure M. And then you send R to zero. Okay, and you obtain a function. So for any t between zero and one, you have a function on, uh, on the product of M with itself, which describes uh, the, the distortion that you can feel along uh, when going from X to Y from the point of view of the measure. Okay, so indeed if t is equal to one, uh, this, uh, this ratio is equal to one. So when you take the limit, it is again equal to one. So in particular, beta one is always one and beta zero is always zero because when t is equal to zero, your red uh, ball is collapsed to X. So the measure is zero. And so beta zero is zero. And now in the next slide, I'm going to uh, study a little bit the asymptotic of this object here for fixed endpoints and when t goes to zero. Okay, because we say that uh, when t is equal to zero, this uh, distortion is zero, but what happens when you go to zero, when you tend to zero? Uh, so this is just the definition uh, that uh, we had in the previous slide. Uh, so in the Riemannian case, for example, it's very easy to prove that as soon as X and Y are outside of the cat locus one of the other, uh, then uh, these coefficient have a universal asymptotic. Uh, so this beta T is asymptotic to T to the N. So this asymptotic means that the ratio between the left-hand side and the right-hand side tends to one when t goes to zero. So we have this universal asymptotic given by t to the power of n, where n is the topological dimension. This is what you have in the Riemannian case. 
but now in the subramanian case, the picture is uh, is different, and uh, we have the following proposition, which can be taken as a definition of the Jurassic dimension. So it, it tells you the following fact. So for all x, fix x in M, a point in M on your subramanian manifold, there exists a, a number n, which may depend on the point, an integral number, such that for almost any point in the manifold, your distortion coefficient, your subremanian distortion coefficient has the following asymptotic given by t to the power uh, this big N. Okay? And if the rank of the distribution at the point x is smaller than the dimension of the manifold, then this number here is strictly bigger than the half of dimension of the metric space, which in turn is strictly bigger than the topological dimension of the metric space. And you can uh, take this n as the this, uh, this proposition, you can take it as the definition of the Jurassic dimension if you don't have a definition of the Jurassic dimensions from, uh, from other, uh, given other ways. Yes, if the structure is ideal, uh, it needs to be integral, yes. Actually, in, in general, it needs to be integral. What changes if the structure is not ideal? Indeed, the distortion coefficient can be defined even if the structure is not ideal, okay? This definition here makes perfect sense. But if the structure is not ideal, what changes is this almost every, it is almost everywhere, okay? It is no longer true that you have this asymptotic almost everywhere. You only have it for an open dense set of points. This is um, a big difference that you have in the non-ideal case, okay? Anyway, you can take this definition of the uh, joint dimension. It is the integer such that you have this asymptotic, okay? And indeed in the Riemannian case, all these three dimensions are equal as we said before. Okay, so another important fact uh, of the ideal case of the ideal setting is that the optimal transportation problem is well posed as uh, exactly as it was in the, uh, in the Riemannian case. So this is due to some deep result by uh, Figali Reford building on previous result uh, in, the, in the, the Heisenberg group uh, obtained by Ambrosio Rego, Figali and Julier, and in step two distribution by Arthur and Lee. And this is what happens in the general ideal setting. So suppose that you are on, the, uh, on an ideal subliminal manifold, and then you have the, exactly the, the same regularity theorem that you have in the uh, more or less that you have uh, that you had in the Riemannian case. So for any pair of absolutely continuous measure, there exists a unique optimal transform map between uh, the first one and the second one. For almost any point, uh, for mu zero, almost every point, uh, there exists a unique geodesic sending your initial point to the final one. And you can use these uh, geodesics uh, to build a one parameter family of measures, uh, a vast extent geodesic that interpolates between mu zero and mu one. And and moreover, what is important is that this mu t is absolutely continuous for all times, okay? And then we have this, uh, this result, uh, which uh, I obtained in collaboration with my collaborator, David Barlari in Padova. So we proved that on an ideal subramanian manifold of dimension, of topological dimension m, uh, take two measures, mu zero, mu one, uh, as usual, absolutely continuous and with compass support absolutely continuous with respect to the smooth measure M that we fixed from the beginning. So since uh, we have a vast geodesic between mu zero and mu one, and this is absolutely continuous. So it makes sense. Uh, so the, the density rho T is well-defined. And for all times, uh, the following interpolation equality holds. So this is an equality for the density of the uh, interpolating measure mu T along the uh, geodesic uh, that sense uh, that moves if you want the point x to the point t big t of x okay so on the left hand side you have the density computed uh, of the vast and geodesic computed at time t at the point uh, gamma t of the geodesic to the power one over small n and on the right hand side you have the same object at time zero and at time one but then you have weights given by the distortion coefficients that we have defined before. So this may seem a very complicated uh, inequality, uh, but it's the most fundamental one because you can use these 
to prove many other inequalities, including the Brominkowski one. Okay, so now we uh, will stop to talk about optimal transport, and I'm going to show you an application of this theorem so that we can recover Brominkowski type inequalities on subdominant manifolds. Okay, so starting from uh, this uh, theorem here, you can see that uh, a particular in, uh, an interesting case is when these beta are bounded from below by some simple function. Okay, for example, suppose that we have a subriemannian manifold where the beta are bounded from below by t to some power big n. This power big n here, uh, I don't want, I don't want to confuse you, but this uh, big n here is not the geodesic dimension, but it must be bigger than the geodesic dimension, okay? Because the geodesic dimension tells you the asymptotics of this guy when this goes to zero. So if you have this bound, necessarily you must have that this big N should be bigger or equal than the geodesic dimension, okay? Anyway, so suppose that you have a subliminal structure where this bound is true. And this is true, for example, for several structures. For example, for the Heisenberg group, where this is true with the n equal to five, for H-type groups, uh, step two kernel groups, and several other structures. Uh, here you have more or less the full list. And using the previous result, we can prove that these three inequalities on this slide are, are equivalent. Okay, so the bound on, on the distortion coefficient, this bound here, the modified Brominkowski inequality. So this is the modified Brominkowski inequality that you that we have seen already in uh, in the case of the Heisenberg group it was the one discovered by Balog, Cristalli, and Sipos. Okay, where you have the weight uh, with a power here big n divided by small n. So small n is always, is always the topological dimension of your manifold, and big n is the big n that you have here. And this Brumikowski inequality is equivalent to the measured contraction property. And this is, um, I mean, the one implication is trivial in the sense that you just have to take A equal to the set um, up to the point X. And then you can simplify this big N. Sorry, you can simplify this small N and you obtain the measured contraction property. And from the measured contraction property, you can obtain the inequality for the beta. And using the previous uh, theorem, you can again, obtain the modified Brominkos inequality. So these three are equivalent, but the only non-trivial step is proving that one implies two. And this uh, goes through this theorem here. Okay, so now what can we do with this, uh, with this theory? What can we do with this theory? So what we like to do is um, to build a bridge between the study of, um, between the geometric analysis, metric measure spaces, and subremanent geometry that can go both ways. And I will show in the next two slides two examples of uh, how this bridge can tell us something new or something interesting. So the first one is a theorem by Milman, uh, which is quite recent. So he proved the following. He proved the Sobolev type inequality for uh, uh, Carnot groups, for ideal Carnot groups. So for generalization of the Heisenberg group, if you want that satisfy the modified Brominkowski inequality, okay? So actually uh, the modified Brominkowski inequality is not sufficient. What we need is the statement of this theorem here with the beta replaced by the T to the big N. Anyway, this is just a minor difference. So suppose that you have an idea subliminal structure of topological dimension N that satisfies the Brominkowski inequality, the modified Brominkowski inequality this should be modified, not weighted, uh, with ratio uh, big N divided by small n. That is, it satisfies this inequality here. Then for any compact set and then Lipschitz function on that set, you have these um, sublet type inequalities. Let me explain uh, it. So on the right-hand side, on the energy side of the inequality, you have the, the norm of the horizontal gradient of F. So the horizontal gradient, if you want, is the gradient in the direction of the distribution. And the integration here is over the geodesic envelope of omega. So omega is not geodesically convex a priori. And so here you take the geodesic envelope of omega. And on the other side, so on, the, on the L2 side, if you want, you have the usual uh, L2 norm 
of f minus the average f omega on omega. And the constant, the, what, it, what is interesting here is that the constant that you have on the left-hand side is precisely the one you have, you would have in the Euclidean setting, but you also have this factor one divided by two to the difference between big N and small n, uh, which, is the, which is very interesting because all previous inequalities, because this gives you a, an exponential improvement over all, expo all explicit constants we had in the literature for uh, sublevel type inequalities on this type of structures, okay? And what is the technique from uh, geometric analysis in metric major spaces that was used here was a localization that uh, some of you know very well. And uh, he was able to apply localization in this setting, uh, starting uh, with the interpolation inequalities uh, that we have in an ideal uh, subdomain structure. Okay, so the other direction is the following one. So an example of the other direction is the following one. So how uh, subdomain structures can give us new examples, uh, new insight in the theory of metric measure spaces. This is related with a, a very nice theorem uh, by Perelman, uh, later generalized by Petrunin, uh, which uh, is a theorem about the, the, the doubling of um, metric space. So suppose that you have an Alexandrov space with curve, Alexandrov uh, space with the curvature boundary from below by K and with dimension N. And then you can consider the metric double of this guy, right? You take uh, space, take the double. And it turns out that <clears throat> this, uh, the, the double of X is uh, again an Alexandrov space. So uh, the curvature boundary is preserved uh, and the curvature boundary is preserved and it is the same. So if k, if x was bounded, had curvature bounded from below by k, then also the double has, bound, has curvature bounded from below by k. And also the dimension remains the same. Okay, so dimension and curvature remain the same when you lower bound on the curvature and uh, the dimension remain the same when you double x. And one uh, problem in the theory of metric measure space is to uh, extend this theorem to more general classes of uh, structures that is find suitable generalization of curvature bounds. So in particular, uh, one interested in uh, generalization of this theorem where the curvature bound is a rich type curvature bound. And uh, as we know, uh, one very weak uh, concept of rich curvature bound for metric measure spaces is the MCP, KN. So when k is equal to zero, it is the inequality that we, we have seen uh, previously. And what we can prove uh, using uh, uh, subdivided setting is that uh, the Perelman doubling theorem cannot hold for MCP metric space, for MCP metric measure space. And the counter example is uh, precisely uh, a subdivided structure, okay? So uh, I'm not going into details, but uh, it turns out that you can build a counter example, so a structure with boundary, uh, that satisfies the MCP04, so with some values of K and N, but the double does not satisfy the MCP04. Okay, so now uh, to include this, uh, this part, uh, just one slide about what can go wrong in an ideal case, okay? So there are two main problems. The first one is uh, the loss of regularity of subdivided distance. So in, in on ideal structure, a very important property of the distance is that it is locally semi-concave in charts outside of the diagonal. So what does it mean? Well, if you know what a um, semi-concave function is, um, that's fine. If you don't know it, it's uh, a very, uh, it's a generalization of convexity that in particular, in, of concavity, that in particular implies twice, that, uh, that your function is two times differentiable almost everywhere. And this is a very important uh, property that we have, that we use uh, in the subremanent setting. And it turns out that this regularity does not hold uh, when you have abnormal geodesics. Okay, so you have a loss of regularity. And the second problem, and this is used, uh, if you don't have this regularity, it's difficult uh, even to prove that the optimal transportation problem is well posed, for example. And the second problem, is uh, related with the regularity of the vast time geodesic. So as I said before, um, 
an important feature of the hospital transportation problem in the ideal setting is that the uh, vast tangeresic mu t is uh, absolutely continuous. Okay. But now it turns out that in the subarray setting, you can have something, uh, some uh, branching phenomenon. That is, you can have geodesic that splits, split off at some point. So I hope it is clear what branching of geodesic means. So you have, a, let's say, a one parameter family of geodesic that uh, they coincide on some interval. And then at some point, they split off. This does not happen in the, in the, in the remaining case. It happens, for example, on Fiesler structures. Okay. But it does not happen in the remaining case. And if you have this kind of uh, phenomenon, then you can expect the uh, interpreting measure here to lose absolute continuity, okay? Because suppose that you have a very big set of branching geodesic. So this is uh, the branching point, if you want. And they cover some uh, set here with positive measure. And you can imagine that if you move the characteristic measure of A to the uh, a delta measure at this point, you will lose absolute continuity at some point because all the mass squeezes at the point of branching. And uh, up to some years ago, it wasn't clear whether branching could happen on a general subliminal structure or not. Indeed, it does not happen. It does not happen in the ideal case. But uh, with my student, uh, Thomas Mietone in Grenoble, we discovered that uh, subliminal and Jurassic can branch. So even if your, your space is not a Finsler type space, so your metric is not given by a norm, but by a true scalar product, you can still have branching. And uh, we built an explicit example in dimension three where uh, we have part of the space, which is um, of Heisenberg type, where you cannot have branching and a part of the space, which is of Martinet type. I didn't say uh, what the Martinet structure is, but it is a structure where you can have an abnormal geodesic. And what happens in the transition region is that uh, you have branching. So these abnormal geodesic coming from the Martinet region splits off in a one parameter family of geodesics uh, in, the, in the Heisenberg region. And all of this happens uh, preserving the minimality of geodesic. So these are true geodesics. So this is what can go wrong. And this is why the, uh, the ideal assumption is, is necessary. Uh, I mean, maybe that these uh, interpolation equalities uh, can be proved in, also in the non-ideal case, and this would be very interesting, but there are several uh, problems to be, to be addressed. Okay, so now if I have uh, more time, I can uh, talk uh, last few slides about uh, comparison theory for these, uh, for these distortion coefficients. So I will, go, uh, I will go very fast and I will use the, the remaining remind geometry to, uh, to explain myself more, uh, more brief, briefly. Uh, so what do I mean by comparison theory? We would like to prove some theorems where given some assumption on the geometry, we can prove some lower bound on the distortion coefficients, okay? So for example, if the rich curvature is bounded from below, then the distortion coefficients are bounded from below by some model distortion coefficients. And this type of theorem is very useful because if you have this, you can plug it in the interpolation inequalities and you can obtain a nice explicit interpolation inequalities. So this is the model example that I have in mind is a, a consequence of the bishop gromov theorem. It's almost equivalent to the bishop gromov equivalent. Uh, and uh, it is the following statement. If you have a Riemannian manifold of dimension N equipped with a Riemannian measure, and we reach a curvature bounded from below by some constant k, <clears throat> then the distortion coefficient is bounded from below by explicit distortion coefficients given uh, here in the right hand side. And these explicit distortion coefficients are the one that you have in the space forms, right? On the uh, simply connected Riemannian manifold with rich curvature equal to k. And this theorem has several consequences uh, that, uh, for example, Bonemeyer's type theorems, uh, that is diameter bounds, uh, volume comparison theorems, heat kernel estimates, et cetera, et cetera. And this is what I would like to prove in the sub setting, okay? But there are several problems to be, to be addressed. First, what are models in that case? So what is a space form in that case? What is curvature? 
this is an even, even bigger problem. And uh, we also should take into account that the measure cannot, there is not a canonical measure. So it should be a theory that works for any choice of measure. Because we don't, uh, we don't have a canonical measure in the similar case. So I will first speak briefly about models, then very, very briefly about curvature. And then I will show you one comparison theorem and that will be it. So what are models in the sub case? So let me start with a remark. So models should be uh, structures where you can compute the distortion coefficient, right? And let me, let me remark also that uh, distortion coefficients, as, a, as, as I defined them before, can be defined for any metric measure space, okay? You only needed a geodesic structure and uh, a measure. So as soon as you have geodesics, uh, yeah, as soon as your metric space is geodesic and uh, you have a measure, you can define the beta. So for example, take as a metric space, a segment, just a, a one dimensional segment, minus A and A. Uh, the metric is just the Euclidean distance. So from the geometric viewpoint, uh, this is flat structure. And as a measure, you consider this measure here. So it is not the Lebesgue measure on the segment, but uh, an absolutely continuous measure given by this uh, function. So K here is a parameter and also N is a parameter. And uh, A uh, is related with K and N in the sense that I want the support of this uh, cosine to coincide with the minus A, A. Uh, okay, so it is a fact that if you compute the distortion coefficient for this segment here, you obtain the same distortion coefficient we have for the n-dimensional space form with curvature K. Okay, so we have no geometry here, just a segment. Everything is in the measure but still we get the same distortion coefficient. So this should uh, open up a little bit uh, to the possibility of having a model, which is not uh, something, uh, it's not a, a structure where the geometry plays some uh, particular role. Okay, you can move everything to the measure, for example. So indeed you can choose in the remaining case, uh, your models to be, either space forms or Euclidean segments equipped with some special measure here. And this is not enough for the Subramanian world. Okay, we need some more general models to be able to describe what happens in the Subramanian case. So now I'm going to define the class of models that we will use for our comparison theorems. So there are variational problems in our N. So from the geometric viewpoint, we are on the flat space in our N. And these models depend on some parameters. So even in the previous case, you had some parameters for the models, right? For example, N, the dimension, and K, the, the lower bound the curvature. And here, the parameters are more general, are matrices, A, B, and Q. Indeed, subliminal geometry, you have more, uh, more ingredients. You have a distribution. So you, you, you expect that your models will have more parameters. So A, B, and Q are matrices of appropriate dimension that would be uh, parameters of my models. On this, uh, on this space, we define admissible trajectories uh, as trajectories that satisfy this type of dynamics. So U is uh, essentially uh, what you want. Uh, so here it is written that it's a function in L2 with values in RK, it's not that important. The regularity is not that important. Uh, this is, um, this uh, requirement is saying you that your trajectory, the velocity of your trajectory should have a drift part. So a drift, which is linear with the position. A is one of the parameters, as I say, there is a matrix here. And uh, you can move as you want in the directions given by the columns of B, of the matrix B. So for example, if A is equal to zero and B is equal to identity, then X can be what you X can be what you want. Any trajectory will be admissible. If A is equal to zero and B is not identity, but the projection of some subspace, then admissible trajectories are trajectories that move whose velocity is uh, in this subspace, okay? But you can have more general dynamics here also with a drift. And then uh, for admissible trajectories, you want to minimize some cost. Uh, given by this, uh, this formula here. So we want to minimize some quadrat cost, which is quadratic in U, 
that is essentially in your uh, speed and also in the, in the position. So this Q is called the potential. And we assume a, con a condition on A and, and B, which is uh, this condition here, which is a necessary and sufficient condition for connectivity of the whole space uh, by admissible trajectories. So this is called the Kalman condition in control theory. So it turns out that uh, optimal trajectories, that is admissible trajectories with fixed endpoint that minimize this cost, satisfy some nice uh, Hamiltonian dynamics. So they are all projections of solutions of uh, the Hamilton equation uh, given by this Hamiltonian, okay? It's a nice quadratic Hamiltonian in the uh, usual canonical coordinates P and Q. And for all the AQ, pro for these problems are called linear quadratic problems, so uh, LQ in short. And for all problems that we use, uh, minimizers of these uh, costs exist and are unique. So for any pair of points, I can find a unique admissible trajectory minimizing my cost. So notice that this is not, this uh, does not give a, a structure of uh, length space to our, to, to our n, okay? Because this uh, guy here that we minimize is not a length, a length functional. Can also be negative, for example, but in general, it's not a length function unless uh, Q is equal to zero, for example. And, and uh, yes, and B is equal to one. But in any case, uh, we still have existence of uniqueness of minimizers. So we can use these minimizers to define a concept of uh, uh, interpolation between two points. You give me a point X, a point Y, and there exists a unique trajectory between X and Y. So I can take the point at time T of this trajectory and use this to define interpolation. So in particular, for this structure that are not matrix spaces, are more general, uh, are uh, an example of more general type of structures, <clears throat> I can still define uh, distortion coefficients, right? Take a point X, take a point Y, pick the Euclidean ball <clears throat> at the point Y, and take the interpolation at time T using this uh, dynamic structure uh, that comes from this uh, Hamiltonian, if you want. <clears throat> and then you can define the distortion coefficient in this way. So you obtain a function that depends on the parameter, indeed, A, B, and Q, and a priori, it depends on the initial and final point. But it turns out that uh, this function for a linear quadratic problem does not depend on the endpoints. This is due to the fact that uh, the, the Hamiltonian is quadratic, and so the Hamiltonian flow is linear. As a consequence, this guy does not depend on x and y, but depends only on t and indeed on the parameters. <clears throat> and with this distortion coefficient, you can recover all distortion coefficients you have in the Riemannian case, but uh, much more. So let me uh, give you an example. So take, for example, A equal to zero. So there is no drift at all, no constraint on the velocity. So the matrix B is equal to one. And there's a potential we take Q equal to the K times the identity. So the Hamiltonian in this case uh, of the, the dynamical system is just the Hamiltonian of a um, harmonic oscillator. So K can also be also negative. So this is not properly an harmonic oscillation where K is negative, but an harmonic, uh, I don't know how to call it anyway. <clears throat> this is a very nice Hamiltonian. And if you compute the distortion coefficient of the linear quadratic problem associated with this Hamiltonian in our n, you obtain precisely the uh, Riemannian distortion coefficient of the space form with the Ricci curvature uh, equal to k and dimension n. But you can, you, you have much more freedom in this setting because you have a lot more parameters here. You have A, you have B, and you have Q that you can play with. Okay, so this defines a class of models. Now, what is curvature? I will go very fast on this. Uh, there is no way to define a canonical curvature uh, using some kind of connection in the subrimanian case, at least not in a way that is uh, useful for comparison theorems. Uh, so this is due to the fact that there is no uh, intrinsic uh, connection associated with a metric uh, in the, the subrimanian case. So the levi theorem does not hold. And the fact that, uh, as I said before, there is no intrinsic volume uh, forces you to work with an external measures. And so what you want is uh, not really a rich type tensor, but a, a Bacriemery rich type tensor, if you know what I mean. So there, there are several approaches to curvature in the subrimanian case. 
so I'm quite out of time, so I won't explain all of them, uh, but I will focus on the third one, which is the one that seems to be uh, more useful for comparison theorems, okay? So in this setting, so this is um, a theory that uh, was pioneered by Agrachov and Kralize and then developed uh, subsequently by several other authors. In this approach, curvature is, uh, is seen as uh, an invariant of the Hamiltonian flow. So an invariant associated with the, uh, the geodesic flow seen as a Hamiltonian flow, okay? So there is a way to extract from the geodesic flow some invariants. In the Riemannian case, you only have one invariant, which is the Ricci curvature. In the semi Riemannian case, you have many invariants. So you have more than one Ricci curvature. And this is what I will use in the next theorem. So I didn't define the Ricci curvature that I'm using now because it's technical and uh, there is no time to do it. So I, just, I, I will just state the theorem. So fix fix an ideal subrimanent structure and fix a non-trivial geodesic gamma, satisfying some technical assumption that are needed to define the curvature. And fix a number big N bigger than the, uh, bigger or equal if you want, than the topological dimension of your manifold. This big N will play the same role of the uh, N that you have in the Bakremery rich curvature, okay? Exactly the same role. And then you can define a number of rich curvatures associated with your geodesic. So when I say a number of rich curvature means that, uh, so they are indexed by alpha, alpha is in some set that depends on the geodesic that I have chosen. There are more than one, in the remaining case, you only have one. So let me extend the notation, this rich depends, uh, these rich depend on the measure M indeed, on the geodesic gamma, on this parameter big N, and then there is this index alpha that is telling you which of the many Ricci you are considering. So these objects here that I have not defined are consistent with the Riemannian theory in the sense that in the Riemannian theory, in the, in the Riemannian case, this set of indices is just one index. So there is only one of these guys. And what you obtain is the standard Bakriemeri Ricci tensor associated with the measure M and the parameter big N. And moreover, if the measure is the Riemannian one, you can choose the, this big N to be equal to the topological dimension and you get the standard Ricci curvature. So you recover the Riemannian case, uh, but this is more general. And then suppose you fix a geodesic and suppose that all these Ricci curvatures are greater or equal than are bundled from below, okay? Then there exists an explicit LQ model that is one of the models. When I say explicit LQ model means an explicit choice of matrices A, B, and Q uh, that indeed depend on the lower bound and all the other uh, parameters, such that the distortion coefficient is bounded from below by the model distortion coefficient raised to some power that you is related with the fact that you have to choose an n big n bigger than small n. This, uh, this, this ratio here, you also have it in the, in the Bakriemeri case, so it's not that important. What's important here is that in, on the right hand side, you have an explicit IQ model that can be computed explicitly once you have the lower bound on the curvature. And this type of uh, theorem here uh, gives you several uh, sharp, um, interpolation equality in the subrimanent setting, but also uh, Bonnemeyer's type results, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So this, is, uh, uh, this theorem here uh, is really the generalization of uh, what I presented before as um, a consequence of the bishop long theorem, okay? So this, is, this was the last slide. Uh, thank you for your attention.